I have been given the task to talk about accidental nuclear war and what you can do about it. And in particular, I've been given the very challenging task of instilling some optimism into this <laughs> before lunch, hence the smiley face. So first of all, on the optimistic note, raise your hand if you are at MIT for work, student, or something like that. Okay, and raise your, take them down and raise your hand if you are a student at MIT. Yay, that gives me a sense of optimism that even people who are studying for finals make a point of coming out here. Okay, so first of all, to prep for the optimism part, let me just very, very briefly, in less than three minutes, summarize all the most depressing things. <laughs> and I'm going to do it with a very short video. Today, I've got guest and physicist Max Tegmark here to answer some questions. Hey, Max, why should I care about nuclear weapons? Because we've learned that they're even more dangerous than we first thought. The biggest threat from nukes isn't explosions that kill millions of people, or radioactive fallout that kills even more, or even a high-altitude electromagnetic pulse that causes mayhem by frying the electrical grid and electronics across the continent. No, the biggest threat from nuclear weapons is a global nuclear-induced winter in which the fires and smoke from as few as a few thousand nukes could darken the atmosphere enough to plunge Earth into a planet-wide mini-ice age with year-round winter-like conditions. This could cause a complete collapse of the global food system and uh, apocalyptic unrest potentially killing most of us 7 billion people on Earth. But didn't we get rid of most nuclear weapons when the Cold War ended? Well, yes and no. When the Cold War ended, the US and Russia slashed their nuclear arsenal but they still have about 7,000 nukes each, which could allow either country to create a nuclear winter all on its own, even if the other doesn't retaliate. But why should I worry about a nuclear winter when nobody in their right mind would start a nuclear war? Unfortunately, an all-out nuclear assault isn't as unlikely as you might think, because the most likely way for a nuclear war to start isn't political, it's accidental. For example, the time faulty computer chips in U.S. alarm systems erroneously signaled incoming Soviet missiles and the U.S. started to prepare for full-blown retaliation, or that time when Russian satellites mistook an unusual glint of sunlight off of clouds for incoming American missiles, and an officer averted retaliation just by ignoring the alarm on gut instinct, or the time after the Cold War ended when Russian radar systems thought a Norwegian scientific rocket was an American nuclear missile and almost launched their missiles in retaliation. You know, these close calls keep happening happening, and sooner or later our luck is going to run out and an entire nuclear arsenal is going to be launched accidentally. Isn't getting rid of nukes a national security threat, though? Well, no, because it's pretty clear that a country only needs a small number of nuclear weapons to have an effective deterrent against nuclear attacks, and any more are as much of a national security threat to the nation that owns them as to the rest of the planet. So given the risks of accidental nuclear war and nuclear winter, it's stupid, dangerous, and irresponsible for any country on Earth to have more nuclear weapons than it needs for deterrence. If we continue hoarding excessive nuclear arsenals, Winter is coming. OK, I have one more question. Why should I spend my time worrying about nukes when there's nothing I can do about them? Actually, there is something you can do. The nuclear arms race isn't driven entirely by security interests. Money drives it too, and politicians would like to act tough. And in a time when they really should be downgrading, the US and Russian governments are both planning to upgrade their arsenals at a huge cost. And who does that money go to? Well, about 2% of the S&P 500 companies are involved in nuclear weapons production. And while you can't stop paying taxes, you can help stigmatize a nuclear arms race by divesting from companies that produce nuclear weapons. I'll give you a link that you can put in the video description to a site that helps you do just that. All right, thank you, Max, and thanks to the Future of Life Institute for their support and help producing this video. All right, so that was a quick summary of, uh, of much of what you've already heard about from other speakers this morning, and then some. Uh, what can we do about this on an optimistic note? Well, let me ask you this question. I have an offer for you. I have this really cool uh, new investment fund. Okay, uh, it, It's great. It invests in building more nuclear weapons. Uh, the, the return on it, if you want to use it for your retirement, is actually about the same as you would get from investing randomly on Wall Street. But uh, my fund is, uh, we, would you like to invest in mine instead? R raise your hand if so. <laughs> so. Uh, the not so funny part is most of you already are investing in my fund without knowing it. I mean, because if, if you have a, raise your hand if you have any kind of investments in any kind of stocks, an IRA or anything like that, yeah? 
Raise your hand if you have explicitly checked to see whether it's investing in nuclear weapons or not. If you haven't, you probably are. We'll hear a lot more from Susie Snyder this afternoon about exactly how you can change that and put your money where your mouth is. <clears throat> and without waiting for, for Donald Trump or anybody else, actually sh shift your money <clears throat> into what you believe in. There is a piece of paper being passed around where you can add your contact info if you would like um, Richard Mala, who has a lot of experience in, uh, in um, investing, to help you out with this. Um, can someone raise their hand if they're the keeper of this piece of paper right now? There it is, perfect. So when it comes to you, if you just write down your contact info there, <clears throat> Richard or maybe Lucas Perry will reach out to you and give you more information <clears throat> so you can decide what you actually want to do. That's one example <clears throat> of something you can do. What is our goal, all in all, about all the, with all this depress depressing stuff? Well, <clears throat> to me, it's ultimately very simple. Uh, raise your hand if you would like, in this current situation, for us to have even more than 15,000 nuclear weapons on the planet. <laughs> okay. Raise your hand if you think it would be better to have at, at least to go a little bit to the other direction. Yeah. So it doesn't matter whether you want to get rid of them all or just have enough for deterrence. <clears throat> you all agree you want to go to the left here. H how can we accomplish that? I'm going to summarize the rest of my talk in one word. Stigmatize. <clears throat> and spend the rest of my time unpacking what I mean by this exactly. I'm going to make you a little analogy between how we successfully stigmatized smoking and see what lessons we can draw from that for stigmatizing the nuclear arms race. You have the power <clears throat> to add more stigma to things that you don't like, not just when you vote, but also when you share information with other people <clears throat> on Facebook or by talking to them. So we have collected a lot of resources uh, on our website, which is this. This is where you, you can see this thing about the money wasting. If you want to sh share that video I showed with people, it's here. Um, we have a lot of other things there. Union of Concerned Scientists and many others have a lot of wonderful material. Please share that, and you help, help stigmatize. Um, you can also think when you invest, when you shop, and Susie Snyder will talk more about how you can, you can stigmatize. Now, smoking. Why did smoking lack stigma when my dad was a kid? Why? Well, sm smoking made people think you were cool because that's what all the cool news anchors were doing and the cool actors and so on, right? No, it wasn't addictive, at least not according to the leading newspapers and, law <coughs> and legal judgment. No, it didn't cause cancer. And it was just even viewed as a symbol of female empowerment, right? How did the stigma gradually get added to smoking to the point that smoking has dropped over by a, fact, by a factor of two in the United States and to the point that when I see someone smoking now at MIT, I just subconsciously, I feel really guilty about this because it's biased, but I just tacitly assume they're not a student <laughs> and they don't work here. Uh, and the people I do know, the friends I have who are actually smokers, they are all trying to quit. How did that happen? Well, because gradually these myths got demolished by a lot of people doing all sorts of creative things to get the word out. What can we learn from this? Well, we can look at exactly the same question. Why is there not much stigma about our nuclear policy? Here's my little collection of, of um, my little top seven list. And let's spend a little bit of time just unpacking this one at a time. Well, I know the risk of nuclear war ended with the Cold War. We already heard enough about <coughs> why that's not the case. This is a message that needs to get out more widely. Uh, shrinking our arsenal will just make us less safe. Well, um, <coughs> I just for fun looked at the list of the uh, top 1,000 cities in the US. So if, if Russia decided it was going to cut back from 7,000 nuclear weapons to only 1,000 hydrogen bombs, would that remove their deterrent power? Would that make us? not worried about being attacked by the Russians? Oh, no, because they would still let them nuke New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, and all the way down to great metropolis of Green Acres, Florida, Meridian, Mississippi, Puyallup, Washington, which I have managed to find a little photo for you there so you can see how big it is, and even Woburn, Massachusetts. 
my name, very close to where I live, with a population of 39,000. So raise your hand if the city that you live in has more than 39,000 people. Okay, that means you will still be deterred, even if Russia gets rid of six-sevenths of its hydrogen bombs, right? Um, if you do this in Russia, you get down to even smaller cities. So the, clearly, we don't need 7,000 for nuclear deterrence. The US military has, has come out even with a report saying 300 was sure would be enough. Will this upgrade make us safer? We've heard enough about no way it wouldn't. We have nukes only for deterrence. Clearly, no, there are some other reasons we have them too. Compellence, not this deterrence, like trying to compel people to do things by threatening first use and so on. <clears throat> then there's this whole idea that the arms race is mainly driven by national security. That's certainly one driver, but we will hear a lot more from Susie Snyder about how money drives it also. And finally, as we heard very eloquently from Lisbeth Gronlund here, if it starts, it probably will not start very, very deliberately because everybody loses from it. It will probably start by accident. So if we can get this information out, there will be more stigma. Now, <clears throat> I was... I promised you to insert some optimism into this, okay? To me, the most exciting thing that's happened in years in this area is something which is happening right now. And it has to do with the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, where in 1970, right, there was this great agreement where the, where the people who didn't have nukes agreed to keep it that way, in return for those who did agreeing to a, a treaty, working hard towards a treaty on general and complete disarmament under strict and effective international control. However, it's become increasingly clear to those who didn't have nukes that there was a little secret subclause to this thing they signed on, which said, ah, oh, just kidding. <laughs> There's obviously no way that the nuclear powers are really going to do this. And this has become so manifestly obvious now <clears throat> that the rest of the world voted late last year to start negotiating in the United Nations to treat nuclear weapons just like bioweapons and chemical weapons, as the map weapons of mass destruction that they are, to ban them. Why? To stigmatize. Not because they were naive and thought that the US and Russia and every North Korea were going to give up their nukes this way, but because this was going to add stigma. Okay? Um, the New York Times chose not to cover this. And then, then there were negotiations that actually began just last month. <coughs> in the United Nations. It was super exciting to be there with Susie Snyder and so many others who have been driving, driving this. Uh, there would probably have been no coverage again in the New York Times or any US media if Donald Trump hadn't helped us out by sending out his ambassador to stand outside while the mo majority of the world's nations and people were represented negotiating, complaining. It's, oh, this is stupid. Those people don't understand. And um, because of that, journalists came, and the New York Times actually wrote about how Trump was against this, and they mentioned, oh, by the way, there's some people who are for it, also like these 3,000 scientists who've signed this and a few other folks. Really exciting energy there, and here's Beatrice Fien sitting in the back, who's been very much driving this effort from the civil society side. Here she is with, with Susie Snyder. It's striking generally how most of the pro-arms race forces are guys, and <laughs> most of this is driven by, by women. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> make of that what you wish. Uh, yeah. So this is a super, super exciting initiative. And I want to just uh, take my last minute to uh, reflect on what, where this leaves us. <clears throat> what I think we really should have as a goal is to get enough stigma around the current nuclear policy that whenever there's a conversation in a bar or on the hill or anywhere where someone says one of those seven things, they will follow it up by saying, oh, just kidding. Or at least someone else in the conversation will. If, just the way it would go today if I stood here and started to lord over you that, you know, smoking doesn't really cause cancer. You know. When we get to that point, there's going to be so much more stigma against this that the nuclear arsenals will shrink quite under their own weight. And it doesn't have to be people in this room who push for it. There's plenty of people with a lot of power who want to use all that money for other things. Right? So as soon as there's more stigma, it strengthens everybody else, and things start moving in the right direction. So that's my optimistic message before lunch. Thank you.